Transforming a neighborhood cannot be done overnight. Bringing art to the common spaces, building parks from a dump, taking the best art to the doors of people are the purposes of Casho Studios in Romerillo, a suburb located in the west of Havana City. The creator of this idea is Alexis Leiva, a painter and an art installation maker. Everyone knows him in Cuba by the name of Cacho. Cacho, tell me why did you decide to build Cacho Studio and why here? It occurred to me as follows. I was in Italy, in Venice, presenting an exhibit. My friends called me over the phone. Brother, come over here. We've got a house in Novedadado with 15 bedrooms and two pools. Get that money, and with it, we will buy a huge house in Venado and open a huge restaurant or a little inn. So my friends told me, see how things are going. Let's do something. I was in Venice. So I returned to Cuba. I had already thought of turning this place in a cultural center. And that's how we uh, just uh, started. We laid the first stone and we began working here in uh, July 2012. And why not make the restaurant in the big house and do this with your own money? My answer to that is because it is very useless for a society that in times of change, that its citizens rush out just to benefit from changes, it is useless, bad, negative, and harmful that those who have uh, something get desperate over having much more over the backs of others. That's very bad and harmful for society. So I think and act the way I do, and I'm always referring to it, and I must prove it with specific actions. So considering the way I think and act, it would be very harmful that I open a restaurant here at a big inn in Novedado. It would be belied everything I've done in my life. That's why I've done this, which is what I like. You told me that this is a non-profitable institution, but there were headlines the day you launched this project and opened this place. You were here with Eusebio Leal, the historian of the city, and even Fidel Castro, and he doesn't visit this kind of activity. How did you manage to have him here? Well, you mentioned the different celebrities. First, Fidel Castro came. The rest doesn't matter. I've got to say it. He came. That's what matters. Why did he come? To see this place, which is inspired in the way he sees life, his ideas, his vision of the future. I think that's why he came. He came because a place like this describes and shows what the revolution is all about. I see in your work a lot of boats. Let me tell you something. Sorry for interrupting you. Kasia, you don't let me do my job. This is an interview. No, I don't. Never. It's interesting. On the opening day, the day Fidel Castro came, the day you opened this officially, the day the rebels entered Havana in 1959, the 50th anniversary of Fidel's arrival in Havana, not just any day in history. I knew Fidel was coming. I had invited him just as the man he is. I wrote him a letter inviting him, and all my heart and wishes went to him in that letter. I always do it like that. So yes, it is so special that Fidel Castro, on such a big day in history, came to visit a place like this because, well, people thought they would not see him, but they did. People did not believe you. Neighbors saw him and couldn't believe their eyes. It was Fidel just arriving in front of their places that day, and Fidel rarely goes out, and he just showed up in this very humble neighborhood on such a significant date. Nobody knew he was coming. I told no one. They kept asking me. There was Eusebio, Anabel, and Miguel Barnett. They were asking me what would be happening here. And I, like a baseball pitcher, I hit my ball all the time. 
It was raining. People kept coming in. Annabelle asking me what would happen here. Wait, we'll have the opening soon. And everybody was wondering because it was very unusual. It was crowded. It was raining. And I kept waiting. It was scheduled for eight and it was almost nine and nothing happened. Shortly after nine, I requested the people to come with me to the street to unveil the plate on the 50th anniversary of Fidel's arrival in Havana. And then they would ask what would happen and who was coming. They wanted to know. Then we stood in the street. I remember I told Eusebio and Miguel Barnett and Abel to stay aside there. And then I told people what would happen. Eusebio, Abel, the thing is, Fidel is coming here. They couldn't believe it. Abel hugged me so hard he nearly broke my ribs. And he came. And he came for that reason. And Fidel never goes to a place just because. He never goes to a place he doesn't have to go. That's the way it is and always been like that. In his nearly 90 years of life, in his entire life, he's always been where he should be. It has never been otherwise. And so it was so great to have him here that day. It was so encouraging. And the responsibility, as you imagine. Of course. As usual, that's been with me always. It's like a bug I have. I can see it. In your work, we always see boats and rowings. Let's sit in a boat to talk more about this. Let's sit on the boat to talk. Okay. Casio has exhibited his arts in the most important galleries of the world, but the pass of two hurricanes through Cuba changed his life forever. For 60 years, we've been singing a song. Really, telling a story, you see? That's important. And you wonder how you can show more solidarity. We've showed it throughout the world. True, you can show more solidarity. Many more things can be done. So I repeat to you, it is important, and so much so in times of change, to do the right thing and not to rush out to uh, benefit from changes. That's essential. You made the gift that the Cuban president gave to Pope Francis, Jesus Christ and the cross made of rose. It's very weird. People wonder, and here goes the answer. We live in an archipelago of a little more than 2,000 islands. And unfortunately, by 2050, the sea level will have risen all over the planet. Can you imagine that? This area will be more of an archipelago than a continent. If you think of Cuban history, everything is connected to the sea, from the emergence of the island of Cuba as a rock for which surfaced from the bottom of the sea in the west, and from there on, you always see things connected uh, with the sea. You'll find the discovery. First, you'll see the Cuban aborigines, like in the rest of the continent and the Caribbean, then Columbus, slavery, our Lady of Charity. Everything through the sea. The sea. You go on and you'll see the Grandma Landing and the Bay of Pigs, migration, and then later you'll see uh, global warming and rising sea levels. So the sea is our blood. How did you think about this idea of the Pope's gift? That piece was not made as a present for the Pope. No. I made this piece called Miracle. It was in an exhibit at the Vatican last year, in May 2014. Of all the pieces there, it was, of course, the biggest one in the exhibit, which included drawings and sculptures, and there was a sensation everywhere. Everybody liked it, and they saw it and said they loved it. Everybody liked it. It. I brought it back to Cuba. It is very heavy. People were wondering why Cacho would not sell the cross in Italy. No, I brought it back to Cuba. You came with the weight of the cross. I hung it on that wall right there. It was exhibited there. Museum people from the world came, including those from a museum in Atlanta. And they got crazy about the piece and made me offers to buy it. I uh, told them it was not for sale. How come? We rank among the top 10 museums of the world. It is true, it's a great museum, but it's not for sale. Watch TV in the few days from now. So I told them, there's an important thing to know. I never, 
or almost never do I do my stuff on my own. That's not my idea about life. Who's with you? Many people, even people I don't know. There are many people in the background of Cacho's work all the time. And that's my idea of life, that people share my dreams and also become part of them. That's my way to achieve things. So working on an old, dirty ore may seem kind of uh, crazy, but that old and dirty ore has a lot of history, the history of many people. For example, you may remember that it may represent rubber ores many people roll with to feed their families each day of their lives, either with the fish or by selling it. That piece represents that. Such story is in those ores. It is part of the reality. That's the miracle. The daily quest of man to deal with everything, things, and go on and on and keep on growing and growing. So that's a true miracle. What did the Pope told you? What did the Pope say about that piece? You greet him. Yes, of course. Didn't you hear it? More than I would have wanted. <laughs> the Pope congratulated me and thanked me very much, and he told me it was an impressive piece, much in line with these terrible times of so many wreckages. He told me that. I was uh, moved. And how did he take that to the Vatican City? In pieces. He asked me, can I take that with me? Of course, we will disassemble it for you today. Really, really, Your Holiness, we will disassemble it now. You talk about the people behind your art, and there are people that say that art should be beautiful, but you don't create a pretty one. What's beautiful? <laughs> What's beautiful to you? Ideas are beautiful. Ideas are beautiful, and art can make any idea beautiful, no matter how hard it is. An artist I admire so much, Rembrandt, said that for an artist, responsibility is a ballast. It could be so in Rembrandt's times. We are in the 21st century. You see, a 21st century artist having no sense of responsibility is a balance for society. Seriously. That's how I see it. All my life I've heard people talking about art and its democratic space and so on. I've heard that in Venice, in Sao Paulo, and all over the world. In all the art circles of the world, art is always striving to have a true democratic space for them so that people from Australia can have access to it. This is still a rather pending issue. So, for a long time now, when I design something, I've always thought of people. For instance, it is not the same going to a sports gear shop to buy 200 ores than getting an ore from, made from pieces of a window because the man who made it only had that to contrive it. There is so much strength and power in that, and such power should be portrayed. It should be described for the future. Because when I made Miracle, I was trying to show that energy, which is not mine, but belongs to all, and is social property, and has nationality, and idiosyncrasy, and defines the people at such an important place as the Holy See, which is the oldest institution of the world. That's the energy in Miracle. It is miraculous collective energy and message. You almost made a miracle, Casho, with the Marta Machado's brigade after the destruction that the hurricanes Ike and Gustav left in Cuba. You could have stayed in the comfort zone of being the famous artist, but you went out. You stayed in the Isle of Youth. You called your artist friends. They tackled the difficulties of those days with you, and you use art to intervene, to solve problems. What's the function of art in these modern times that we live in, Cash? The Marta Machado Brigade. Your mother. Yes, my mother. The person who made me the way I am. The responsible of all this. I am like this. Yes. The one responsible for all this, even from my height. I tell you about uh, an important thing. Honestly. In the year 2001, 
I was in the Isle of Youth working on a piece called The Jungle, and the island was hit by hurricane. I think it was called Michel. And I made a piece called Michel SOB. Because when I was making The Jungle, Michel tore off the roof of the factory where I was working. It didn't harm my piece, but tore off part of the factory roof and I was in the factory when it happened. I was 31, and I just went out to see my island, and it was totally ravished. I'm telling you this story to explain an idea. I went out in the car and saw all the destruction everywhere, and at that time, I had uh, neither the experience nor the strength I have today. You know why? Because I was just an artist. That's what I was in 2001. Why only and now you're not only an artist? Just an artist who was in fashion who was 25 and who had just presented an exhibit at the uh, Reina Sofia in Madrid, and that's all I was, a famous young Cuban artist whose pieces were exhibited in all the museums of the world you can think of, and who had participated in all biennials and the collections. I was that. I went to the island I had been born, which had been raised by the hurricane, and I experienced seeing that firsthand as when I was a kid. And I tell you, what I saw stayed with me for a long time. That energy was with me, as if uh, giving me orders. But it was not until I stepped out of the plane, and this is terrible, that's the right way to put it. I mean, I was in Matanzas and came to Havana to see a piece of mine which had been displayed at the Malacón waterfront for eight years and it had been toppled by Hurricane Gustav. The next day I went to the Isle of Youth on a small plane which had to swerve between the breeze in the runway and I walked from the airport to the La Fe crossroads. A car picked me up on the road and they said, Cacho, what are you doing here? I got in the car and went to the government building, to the command post, and I was shocked. From the airport, I could see Gerona, and everything was flat. You could see the horizon around. There was dust everywhere. I was so shocked. I had never seen something like that. I went to the government command post, and there I was told about all the destruction caused by the hurricane. There was nothing left. It was such a terrible thing. It was like a battlefield. No electricity, no nothing. Walking at night, you couldn't see the ground under your feet. You couldn't see a stick or a hole. There was such a silence. After having all that information at the command post, I walked into the streets with my cell phone as the only light. And I went to the place of some of my friends and neighbors, and I talked to people and saw how they were keeping. And I realized that all the things I had done in my life, everything, including being in fashion at 25, had been in preparation for that moment. You know why? Because what gives value to what I do is what I did then. Everything we did was important to be able to do this and all the things we will be doing in the future. For instance, the Marta Machado Brigade. It may seem a little bit crazy. Many people think so. But returning to uh, Rembrandt, the responsibility of an artist, of a human being, in his time and life, is that. So I say, for instance, that many in the world compare me with the Chinese. Why? Because the Chinese reacted to the hurricane situation. 
good things are said about the Chinese government. I reacted to the hurricane situation by thinking things had to be changed. So instead of making pieces that express rubbish about the hurricane and there were many bad things, I thought I would not change things by just making a piece about it. I would change things by acting. So I came to Havana and sat in a place and wrote a letter to Raul Castro. I sent it to him, and he answered so quickly that I was moved, and I wrote to Fidel. And he included the letter in one of his uh, reflections. So we created the brigade, and just by being there, I realized we had to stay there and share the hardships with those people until things got better. That was clear to me from the start. There was so much destruction. So we just couldn't come and go. And the best thing was many brothers and sisters got the message. Eventually, the leading figures of Cuban culture went there, and it is good we say it because many went there and they just put aside what they were doing. I mean, some comedians canceled their shows, some plastic artists would not open their exhibits, but it was important to do that, very important. And as days went by, people realized it more. Is that the function that art should have? I think so. I think that, yes, art is to accompany man, to be with him, to help him to think and grow. I'm telling you this because you cannot, I mean, otherwise many things will be lost. For instance, you cannot forsake the people who are paying for an artist's training. And that training is so expensive. Studying art anywhere in the world is very expensive. And these Cuban people are paying for everything. They have paid for Cacho's studies, and then Cacho becomes a great artist and goes to New York to live in a building facing Central Park. And he comes to Cuba every six months to see people and open an exhibit and greet everybody. I'm sure that was not the idea of an artist Fidel, Raul, and Almeida had when they attacked the Moncada garrison. The Moncada platform contains an idea of Fidel's about an artist. It is another one. You have to see it and build on it, but it wasn't that one. It is not that of an artist living in New York or Paris, but that of a Cuban artist who should be aware that misbehavior on his part may wreck everything. We know. For instance, a fisherman who catches lobsters and pays for my brushes. And then there's a disaster, and he has to stop. That's the idea behind the Marta Machado Brigade. That's bad, because you must keep on working. I don't understand. The lobsters and the brushes, they needed brushes. Of course. You got to pay for everything. No, I mean, there is a price for lobster catchers. There is a price for a doctor working in Venezuela, or for a fisherman catching lobsters. They are paid for that. Nothing is for free. There is a price. It comes from somewhere. It entails effort. I had the chance of meeting the fisherman who paid for my brushes, of course, and a teacher or a driver, people I never thought I would meet, different people in society you can find everywhere I could have never met because I was in my art world, in another orbit and field. And so I was able to know the man who earns millions for the country by catching blasters and whose roof was ripped off by the hurricane and who lost his roof, his cold box, his family photo album, and his history. He lost everything. I was able to meet that man, and I thank him for what he did for me. Working with him, I learned how to rebuild a roof. I didn't know how to lay a roof. Why? Because I had never had to do it. You know how to make complicated things in art, but not build a ceiling. No, I haven't built one either. I couldn't know how because I never had to. But then I laid one, and a second one, and a third one. And a while ago, I saw a man who needed a roof, and he taught Arcaño and Miguel Enriquez how to do it. And then you could see Arcaño, Miguel Enriquez, and, and Mente Pollo, and many other artists who usually you see only on TV doing it. So there is so much value in seeing an artist you regard as a distant person work so that someone has a roof. 
I witnessed that. I saw it. Seeing the happy face of an old lady after Mente Pollo repaired her house when he uh, laid the last roof tile in her home. Her face was a wonder. I saw it. And I tried to do it again so that people get such energy. I tell you, it was so hard for me later to get back to my studio after that because it was Cuba, then Haiti. For three years, I would not return to my studio. So I say that so many things can be done. They can be done. Sometimes we are wrong while trying to explain things because a solution is not copying foreign things. You may say, let's set the price for it tomorrow. That's not the solution. Let's set the price to benefit the artist so that he doesn't uh, feel, let's say, bad. Or let's set a charge for the doctor so that he feels he can do what he wants with his practice. No, that's not our society. We're not here for that. We have other goals. We have different dreams which are totally opposed to that. So you've got to show the dream can come true. And how can you show it? Fidel went to the Moncada and to the Sierra, and he did many things, but life goes on. How can the children of Fidel, Cuba, and the revolution prove there is a future? That the idea of the revolution is certain, useful, necessary, and important? Which one would be our Sierra Maestra Cacho? Being everywhere. Our road is easier than theirs. We have an easier road. We don't have to go to the hills and find an SOB of a Batista soldier who's trying to kill us after so many accomplishments, so we have to avail ourselves of that. Talking about the many ways, the other ways, this is my Sierra, this is my Moncada, everything in one piece. Other people that have funds, that have money, cannot do this that you're doing in Cash Studios. Who helped you? No, that's the biggest lie of the world. The biggest lie of the world. There are people who want to do things. Things are done, and that's it. Anything else is a lie. Many wanted to save Cuba. Many wanted to oppose Batista. Many wanted to do this and that. But who did it? The generation of the centennial. Understand? Fidel Castro did it. So those are just lies. If I were, if I could, no. We are the children of Cuba. How have you been able to do this? As Cuba does it, it is a small and poor country which shares what it has. I do what this country does. Cuba does it. What is the Pope saying? And in spite of that, that, it must keep doing it and multiplying it. It must show more solidarity and can show more solidarity. It is true you can show more solidarity. The Pope is so right. Of course, we can show more solidarity, more solidarity in life. The rest is a lie. People do things or they don't. Nobody can do it like this because it takes a very complex process of mental and spiritual changes to do something like this. You cannot do something like this thinking in terms of tangible profits. You cannot. It is impossible. Now, I do it because I was there, because I experienced a complex process with many things, the hurricanes and many things, but many people don't do it. Many times they have business. There is the business of uh, such and such who is not an artist. He has a cousin who sent him money. Get the idea? So why not? Why can't that person run a place with 200 chairs and claim it is a cultural attraction? Why? Because it is bad for society. That's why he can't. He can't. It is bad for society. It is bad for society that people wear masks. It is bad. It is very bad that people don't make the right contributions. It may be good that the country is opening up and that there is an experiment with private business, but if such experiment does not contribute to the state coffers, then it will be worthless. Through taxes. The experiment won't work. It will be useless for society, you see? So it is important. If it has an impact on life, then it will be useful and good. Otherwise, it will be bad for the country. Cuba and the United States reestablished diplomatic relations. You were there. 
at the opening of the embassies. There are people that say that Americans are coming and McDonald's are filling the streets of Havana and that Cuba will be recolonized. And I want to know your opinion, Cash. What do you think about this extreme approach? First of all, I believe it would happen only if people let their homes be Americanized. What happens at home is reflected in the streets. That. Now, there are family values that never change. You don't have to change them. When I was a kid, I got the dengue fever. Who introduced the dengue? Who sent it? So I tell you, we Cubans cannot be dubbed as uh, anti-anything. I don't think we are. We are good people, but we are against all those who try to harm us. We have always been so from the aborigines into the endless future. So I tell you, the enemy is out there. It is the same and has the same intentions. This is just a step, a temporary transition that is necessary, you see, for them to solve many problems they themselves have created of isolation from the rest of the world because they have confronted a country like this which has only done good to humanity and has and that has tarnished their image before the world that's why we are in this world they have endeavored to do us harm for over 50 years and we have endeavored to do the right thing thanks to that we are in this position the pope has come and you see how things are going the results from the workings of the whole country and of millions of people you're not scared that Cuba might change? I've got nothing to lose. There are 11 million Cubans, you are only one. But that's what we are here for. See what we are doing here. For 11 million Cubans, no matter where they are. Sure, I have my dreams, I believe in them, and I stand for them with my life. Do I sound crazy? Yes, I'm very crazy. I want people to do this. I stand for everything I believe in very uh, passionately. That's why I do uh, the things I do. But I'm telling you, it is up to us. If the enemy who introduced the dengue fever will invade my home, it is up to me and my mistake to allow that. You see? But what matters is that we know how to stroll along the path we chose. We must not forget the damage of the blockade may be it will be uh, lifted tomorrow, but it has brought so much suffering and want and death, and we must not forget that. That's part of history, and it was imposed by you one imperialism, one I call by its name, U.S. imperialism, not imperialism as an abstract notion or an economic or social and political concept. No, in this case, it wasn't British or Japanese imperialism. It is U.S. imperialism, the one having that, let's say, very peculiar vision of life. Now, true, we will be having the enemy in a more difficult manner than ever inside our home. Fine, we are ready for that. Are we ready for that? We have dealt with worse and more complex things. We are ready for that. In Cuba, we are ready for everything. Casio, your optimists have limits? No, optimism has no limits. That's why it is called optimism. Thank you so much. It's been a truly pleasure. At your service.